Welcome to the Center for European Studies first conversation on Europe event of 2018-19, which is co-sponsored by several uh, partners, most notably the Weiser Center for Europe and Eurasia, the Center for Russian, East European, and Eurasian Studies, the Copernicus Program in Polish Studies, the Weiser Center for Emerging Democracies, and the Ford School for Public Policy. My name is Genevieve Zubrzycki. I'm professor of sociology and director of the Weiser Center for Europe and Eurasia. And today I have the distinct pleasure to introduce um, Dr. Krzysztof Śmiszek, um, who is the WCEE, the Weiser Center for Europe and Eurasia, distinguished fellow. And he will be with us in Ann Arbor for the entire month of September. Uh, so this lecture is the first of a cycle that he will be giving on campus, and I invite you to take flyers in the back of the, of the room that advertise uh, his other um, events. Krzysztof Śmiszek is a Polish human rights lawyer and activist. He received his PhD in law from the University of Warsaw and is currently a lecturer at the Andrzej Fritsch Modzewski Kraków University in Poland. This is even worse than our long names. He's also the managing editor of the Anti-Discrimination Law Review and a founding member and president of the Polish Society of Anti-Discrimination Law, a nationwide civil liberties legal organization. Um, his main area of expertise are human rights in, of minorities and women with a special focus on LGBTQ uh, rights. He's also interested in comparative international anti-discrimination legislations and institutional protection against discrimination. In today's talk, Poland, the EU, and illiberal democracy, Dr. Smyszek will address Poland's right turn and the rise of populism, a topic we've been following very closely here at the, the Weiser Centers in the past couple years. Um, but he will examine more specifically the law and justice government's domestic and foreign policies that undermine democracy in Poland. The picture of political life in Poland, however, would not be complete if we did not take into account civil, civil society's significant pushback against these policies. And so uh, Dr. Smyszek will, will tell us about the various resistance movements at work in Polish society. And his double vision, that is, his vision as a legal scholar and as a human rights activist, will give us a sharper image of the unfolding situation in Poland. Please give a warm welcome to Krzysztof Śmiszek. Um, thank you, Genevieve. Um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm so happy to be here. Uh, first of all, I would like to really thank the Weiser Center for making this happen for having me here, uh, Genevieve, Marisha, and all the staff. Uh, thank you so much for being so helpful in bringing me here to um, share my thoughts and experiences on uh, what's going on in Poland, or has been going on in Poland in the recent um, three years. Uh, the title of my presentation is Poland, the EU, and illiberal democracy. I put a, a, a subti subtitle, Laboratory of Authoritarianism. Why laboratory? Because I think that um, the events that are taking place in Poland in the uh, past three years could be a great, I would say, um, example or could, be, could serve as a manual for all the politicians who are thinking of introducing authoritarian regimes in their countries. Why? Uh, because they are very, I mean, the new government is very much active in different fields, the government is working on hearts and minds of, of, uh, of Polish people uh, to, in order to convince them to the uh, new ideology. So what I am going to uh, focus um, uh, on during this 40 minute speech, uh, there are four, uh, four issues. First of all, I would like to uh, say, say a few words about the uh, the events, the, uh, what has been happening in Poland since 2015 under the slogan good change, dobra zmiana. Uh, I think that all authoritarian regimes, they, uh, they all have this, you know, beautiful slogans 
um, uh, to, to introduce their ide ideologies. Secondly, uh, I would like to focus a bit on the, uh, of the um, um, shrinking space, or the issue of shrinking space for civil, civil society and human rights. Uh, what we human rights activists are witnessing in the last three years uh, is a huge attack on human rights as well as, um, um, I would say, the independent thinking in terms of, of democracy and, and human rights. The third uh, thing that I would like to touch upon is the institutional resistance as, a resistance as well as civil society engagement in the defense of democracy in Poland. And last but not least, I would like to pose a question whether European Union is ready or is prepared to defend fundamental rights violated by one of its member states, which is Poland. Well, I would like to start with a bit of um, history as well as a bit of personal, um, a personal um, thing. Well, this is, um, this is me, 1980. <laughs> few months old, toddler, you know, not knowing anything about democracy, human rights, and what was going on around him in 1980. However, 1980 uh, was a great year for Polish uh, democracy, for, I would also say, your European uh, history. Why? Just to give you a few examples of why 1980 was so important for Polish and European history. Well, the circumstances, the surroundings, uh, the political climate, uh, political regime, uh, it was all very clear. Uh, there was a rule of one party, Communist Party. Uh, there was a visible lack of uh, fundamental freedoms like uh, freedom of assembly, freedom of speech. There, were, there, was, no, there was no free media. There was a huge persecution of democratic opposition. The, uh, of opposition. There were, uh, the whole uh, state apparatus was completely subordinated to the idea of one party. We also have some political murders. Well, uh, there was of course a huge lack, and visible lack of democratic institutions. And we were attached to the Soviet Union by uh, as external um, ally. Well, but also 1980 was a great year uh, since Solidarność movement, movement was uh, blossoming. Uh, we called, uh, actually we call August 1980 as a Solidarność Carnival. There was a uh, time of relative uh, uh, freedom uh, in Poland and the great movement of uh, Solidarność, the trade union, uh, grew up up to 10 million members um, uh, organization. So if you think that, if you imagine that Poland was like 35, 37 million population, so 10 million people belonged to the, uh, to the Solidarność um, movement, the opposition, uh, opposition uh, organizations, organization. So uh, the Solidarność Carnival ended, uh, was finished in 1981 by uh, introducing the martial law. However, it was a great start for um, for uh, democratic changes, which resulted in 1980, 1989 um, um, revolution. So since 1989, Poland was building uh, its democratic standards, I would say fairly consistently. We managed to build an independent judiciary. We uh, managed successfully as a country to fire almost all communist um, uh, agents from, uh, uh, from courts, from uh, the administration. Some of them, of course, survived, but uh, not a uh, significant, significant number. We also successfully built uh, safe space for uh, free media, private, public. Uh, we also introduced a great piece of legislation on freedom of assembly, one, one of the most liberal uh, law on assembly in Europe. Also, uh, we managed to um, build independent 
institutional, institutional guardians like the Commissioner, Office of the Commissioner for Human Rights. And of course, since 1989, we have no political prisoners uh, in Poland. As a lawyer, I can say that uh, we also successfully managed to um, create a transparent and democratic electoral system, balance of powers, and all governments, as of 1989 till 2015, they all, whatever, regard, regardless their ideology, uh, left, center, right, they, they all have clear goals in international politics, which was a membership in NATO as well uh, as uh, in the European Union. So, well, this beautiful story um, ends, well, there have been some problems too. Uh, it was not a, actually a paradise. However, um, some, some problems uh, were as well. Uh, the freedom of assembly was great, but sometimes it could not uh, be enjoyed by several group, groups like LGBT organizations. We also have, um, a we, there was also a mar marginalization of human rights discussions, the overwhelming influence of the Catholic Church on national politics, we call it an alliance of the throne and altar, lack of proper attention to the need of the uh, development of, and support for civil society, and lack of civic education on importance of democracy. And from my perspective, those lacks were kind of ground for a new regime that appeared in 2015. So what happened in uh, 2015 in Poland? Well, in autumn 2015, as a result of completely free and transparent election process, the opposition party, Law and Justice, they, the Polish abbreviation is PiS, so I will leave uh, without any comment for English speakers. Uh, so the Law and Justice Party, they gained 235 seats in the parliament, which consists of 460 seats. Well, they used the slogan of um, uh, good change, dobra zmiana, uh, which became apparently extremely popular and really, um, I was, uh, I'm pretty sure that uh, it caught uh, hearts and minds of, uh, uh, of Polish people. A good change, I would say it's a Polish version of Make America Great Again, uh, and people just bought it. Um, well, uh, for the first time in Polish history, the single party, one party, got, uh, uh, won a, sim a simple majority uh, in the parliament. So there was no need for, t for any uh, talks with any other parties uh, to form a government. So uh, actually, our constitution, which was adopted in 1997, uh, it was a constitution which was designed in, uh, in order to make different parties, I mean, talking to each other and forming a government. So actually, our constitution is for forcing different parties to talk to each other and to collaborate. And as a result of this, uh, of, of this debates, there should be uh, a government formed. In this case, they should, th th there was no need to talk, uh, for talks because uh, one party got all. What's more, a few months before, the uh, member of the Law and Justice Party, Andrzej Duda, won a, um, uh, was elected uh, as a president of the Republic. So at the end of, the, of 2015, we have a situation when the government, when the parliamentary majority, and the president of the Republic are all recruited from one party. So this is a, a, a very important, uh, I would say, um, situation. This is a, a, an, a, a, an unusual situation when uh, one party has everything, actually possess, possesses uh, everything. Well, uh, that was also a result of the low voter uh, turnout, which resulted in high winners result. Only 50% 50, 50 percent of polls uh, went to the ballot boxes, which means that all of those uh, entitled to vote, only 18.5% uh, choose law and justice. 
which is less than one in five of Polish citizens. However, I mean, the winning party took all according to the electoral law. So what were uh, the next steps uh, of the new government? I titled the slides um, with a question, has Poland been taken over by civilized pirates? Why civilized? Because uh, everything what they did, at, uh, at least at the beginning, was in line with the legal and constitutional standards. They won elections because uh, uh, on, on the basis of the electoral law, uh, the electoral uh, process was completely free. Uh, the elections were transparent. So everything worked uh, for the law and justice. They actually did not break any provision when getting uh, their power. But from the first few days of uh, um, of the rulings of the of the ruling of the new uh, new government, it was extremely visible and uh, uh, unsure that um, the majority will use all possible ways to strengthen its power and influence on political life by using all possible means. Well. The first target were uh, independent democratic uh, institutions. Uh, one of the slogans of the Law and Justice Party during the election, uh, uh, election campaign was uh, fighting so-called uh, against, um, fighting against so-called legal impossibilism. What legal impossibilism means? They were claiming that Poland is not developing in the right pace because of the institutions that are blocking the development, like courts, like free media, like um, um, whatever institution you can think of, uh, which, which is based on, uh, on law, uh, they convinced the, the, popular, I mean, the, the Polish nation, the po Polish people, uh, that those institutions are, that should be blamed for all the failures that Poland experienced in the recent 25 years. So uh, the, uh, the term um, legal impossibilism was opposed by the term it's possible, uh, They said everything is possible if you are determined enough. Uh, yeah, so, um, so then it, went, it all went very quickly. Uh, shortly after forming the government, uh, Land Justice Party, uh, filled the constitutional tribunal with its political nominees. Uh, well, the constitutional, uh, constitutional tribunal as a constitutionally regulated body uh, which uh, holds a mandate to uh, check whether all the laws passed by the government or the parliament uh, are in line with the standards of the constitution. So what should you do as an uh, autocrat uh, in order to impose your laws, you just have to change the constitutional tribunal in order to make it, uh, well, collaborative or at least not blocking your, uh, your reforms. We have, this, we have this saying in Poland, if you have a fever, just break the thermometer. So they did the same with the constitutional tribunal. If the constitutional tribunal is blocking the reforms, so we are just simply changing the, uh, um, the judges sitting in the constitutional uh, tribunal. Well, uh, I had a great uh, conversation last week with some of the law professors here in the University of Michigan. And they, are, they were asking me like, so if, if Poland is still operating within legal uh, framework. So at this stage, after three years of implementing good change, dobra um, zmiana, I should honestly say that we are a country which is not uh, operating within the legal and constitutional framework any, uh, anymore. Uh, all the decisions are based on the good or bad will of the chair of the ruling party. Exam example, when the constitutional tribunal, at uh, the beginning of uh, 2016, the old constitutional tribunal um, claim, I mean, uh, issued its, uh, its verdict that some of the decisions uh, of the new parliament in terms of um, uh, the set of the judges uh, in the constitutional tribunal are not in line with, uh, with the constitution. So the prime minister, uh, who is by the law, by the constitution, and by other 
uh, uh, acts of law obliged to publish immediately the rulings of the Constitutional Tribunal, she just simply said no. And for more than two years, she was not publishing the ruling of the Constitutional Tribunal. So can you imagine this situation here in the US that the, well, maybe more and more, but uh, uh, you know, that the, the president uh, is not following the, uh, the verdicts of the court. So this is a daily, um, daily experience of, uh, of, of, uh, of Poland now. Uh, whenever the verdict of the, uh, of the court or other uh, independent uh, um, institution is not in line with the will or uh, uh, will of the ruling party, it is just ignored and the country is still going on. Well, uh, they started uh, their, um, uh, the new government started their fight against independent institutions. Uh, I mean, they firstly focus, of course, on, on courts. So parallelly, they were acting on different, on different levels. They were very active in dismantling the um, judiciary, judiciary system by implementing new, uh, uh, new laws concerning uh, the courts and constitutional tribunal. But at the same time, they started to work on, to work on uh, hearts and minds of Polish people. So what they did, they set up, I mean, the government set up, estab I mean, established uh, a new entity, a, a Polish National Foundation, which was fueled with millions of zlotys. Now they have like six, more than $65 million budget. Uh, that was uh, given by the, contributed by the state-owned uh, uh, companies. So the primary task of the Polish National Foundation is to, let's say, promote good name of Poland around the world. So the first social campaign that was launched by the Polish National Foundation was uh, the, fun the, the, the social campaign, media campaign against Polish judges. So two years ago, you could have seen uh, like thousands and thousands of huge billboards of this, of this type on the Polish streets saying that Polish judges are like thieves that are corrupted, that are politicized, uh, and they just served to the previous governments as well as they are extremely lazy. So they were working on the approach of the, mm, uh, of the Polish uh, society, and now when you ask uh, uh, Polish people, according to the uh, according to the um, uh, to the polls, 80% of polls say the courts are. I mean, the courts should be uh, should be reformed. So you see that they they prepared a ground for um, for this dismantling of judiciary system uh, in Poland. Well, they also started uh, to putting their hands on other independent institutions like National Judicial Council. This is also a constitutional body that safeguards the independence of Polish courts and judges. And since 1989, the members of the uh, National the Judicial Council uh, were recruited, uh, um, they were judges elected by judges. So uh, recently they changed the law. So now the judges, the members of the of the National uh, Judicial Council are elected by politicians. So you can imagine who, uh, who is sitting uh, on the bench now. Well, the, um, uh, the, the, minister, the, the government and the parliament also changed the law on uh, regular, uh, regular courts, the ordinary court, courts. So now the uh, Minister of Justice is the one who is appointing the heads of, uh, of lower courts as well as uh, he holds the power to dismiss uh, the heads of, uh, of the court. So you can also imagine like what's the atmosphere, I mean, what's to be a judge in Poland now when your president of your, your, your court is direct, directly dependent uh, on the, uh, from the Minister of Justice. So it is getting a, uh, getting a nightmare for, for judges to, to act uh, independently. Well, uh, this thing was actually copied and paste, uh, pasted. Uh, uh, that, was a, that is an example, Hungarian example. So uh, the new government 
did the same what uh, Viktor Orban in Hungary did. So they decided to lower the retirement, retirement age of the Supreme Court judges from 70 to 65. A result, the, the result of, uh, of the lowering of the retirement, retirement age uh, is that most, uh, more than 40% of the judges will be just fired in the next couple of weeks. They will be replaced by proper judges elected by the newly elected National Judicial Council. Uh, what's more, uh, the new law passed a few months ago uh, terminated the constitu constitutionally fixed term, uh, which is six years, of the Supreme Court president. This is the lady in the middle of the, uh, of the, uh, of the picture. So we are going into legal chaos. Because on one hand, we are still having a Supreme Court president whose term is ending in 2020, and in the next couple of weeks, we're going to have a new uh, uh, president of the Supreme Court elected and appointed, appointed, appointed uh, by the president of the republic. Well, they also decided to change the structure of the Supreme Court uh, by establishing a new chamber for so-called disciplinary issues. Uh, so the new chamber will be handling a case, but will be handling case, handling cases of uh, those judges who are not acting in line with, well, with law, with uh, expectations of the new government, with uh, standards that nobody knows. Uh, so the members of the newly um, newly created chamber will earn 40% more than the rest of the Supreme Court judges. So I think that they will be quite an obedient, uh, quite obedient judges in terms of handling uh, disciplinary cases uh, regarding those judges of the lower courts who are still uh, uh, trying to, uh, to be independent. Well, uh, it's uh, in the last, oh, sorry, in, in the last three years, we are um, witnessing um, a huge, I would say, and very quick takeover of all institutions uh, in Poland. So, um, well, just let me get to the, to the proper slides. Yeah, the politicized uh, civil service, they politicized civil service, they turned public media into crude propaganda organ, I mean, you just can't stand watching the uh, evening uh, news in public TV. I mean, people who are a bit older than me and remember times of the communist regime, they just say that are even worse than uh, communist uh, propaganda. They took over all the state-owned companies and stuffed them with uh, political nominees. There were some attempts to take over the control of the, over the local authorities. They even changed the internal provisions of the works of the parliament just to silence the opposition. So can you imagine that the debates, which is a nature of democracy, uh, now last maximum 30 seconds in the Polish parliament. The if you are a member of the opposition party, you have 30 seconds to express your view on, on uh, certain issues. So this is the, the standards now we are talking about. Well, they also restricted uh, 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 media presence in the parliament. Well, this is kind of sign that um, maybe they are ashamed of you know, what they're doing. And they also immediately started to uh, restrict women's reproductive rights and started their works on anti-abortion law, which is one of the most restrictive in the world uh, already. They just you know, w want to pay their debts to the uh, to the church, which was a huge supporter in the election campaign of the Land Justice Party. Well, so um, as you can imagine, uh, democratic and independent institutions were not the only target of, uh, of the new, newly elected government and the parliament. The civil society, which started to organize them itself, uh, and started to organize demonstrations and different actions, started to be an, also an easy target for, uh, uh, for the government. So mostly the civil society, civil 
society organizations active in the field of transparency, human rights, women's rights, uh, minority rights, started to become a, um, an easy, a, a target. What happened, I mean, what started to, hap uh, to happen three years ago in Poland? We call it a uh, George Soros panic. Well, the, uh, I mean, I know that you all know who George Soros is and the Open Foundations, uh, Open Society Foundations. Uh, I mean, they are very active in, uh, around Europe, including, uh, including Poland. Some of the organizations, very few, but still, uh, are supported by Open Society Foundations. So it was very easy for them to name and shame all the organizations that were supported uh, by Open Society Foundations. You know, uh, this is not a time to speak about uh, Polish anti-Semitism, but the figure of the Jews sponsoring, you know, uh, from abroad some human rights organizations, it doesn't sound very good uh, in Poland. So those are uh, members, those, those human rights activists, including me, uh, working um, in the field of, of, of human rights and uh, civil society, we are just, you know, being named as traitors of the nation because we are taking money from the abroad. Well, uh, the state also uh, encouraged or, you know, uh, um, stimulated the uh, prosecutors and police uh, who are now quite active in intimidation of the civil society organizations. Well, organizations like mine or, or, or similar, now no, you, you are, we are witnessing uh, uh, cuts, budget cuts and, uh, and uh, the access to the public money that we always had, have to, uh, we, we always uh, have uh, is now denied. So for those who are disobedient, there are no, there are no possibilities to, to get any money from the, uh, uh, from the public, uh, public funds. But at the same time, the alternative, as I call it, civil society, uh, emerged. So every authoritarian regime needs to have some kind of support and backing from, from the society. So it's a great uh, uh, opportunity for all, for all you know, uh, right-wing organizations or organizations that are collaborating with, uh, with the new regime to, you know, to blossom. I mean, there's a river of money going to the church organizations to the far-right groups, and to the older groups, they are acting in line with the new government. Well, freedom of assembly, that's a separate story. Uh, just like I said at the beginning, uh, we were so proud in early 90s uh, that we had a best, I would say, uh, law on, uh, freedom, uh, on assembly uh, in Europe. Now, uh, like two years ago, uh, the new parliament introduced uh, an amendment to the uh, assembly, uh, assembly law and introduced uh, sort of kind of, I don't know even how to describe it, but they name it cyclical assemblies, which means that if you, I mean, if you are organizing an assembly few times per, uh, per year in the same time, so you've got priority uh, before um, uh, other I and mean, over other assemblies uh, that want to be uh, organized or that are going to be organized in the same place. So that was directly um, designed to prevent civil society to organize demonstrations uh, on, on uh, in, in certain places and uh, in certain uh, uh, moments. If you decide to organize any protest you have to face charges under the code of minor offenses for interference with a lawful assembly. So this kind of provisions, they have a sort of chilling effect. Uh, people are getting more and more, well, maybe not afraid yet, but people are, you know, they're thinking twice in terms of organizing a demonstration uh, in the place that is actually forbidden uh, for you to organize your, uh, your protest. Well, these are the faces of some of my friends. I mean, not all of them, because one of them is the former president of the Republic. But uh, there are some, you know, uh, uh, 
situations where the public media are showing the faces of uh, civil rights activists, human rights activists, uh, connecting the, them with, you know, um, with others. Of course, at the end of the story, George Soros appears. And they are trying to, um, to mainstream this story that, you know, everyone fr on the liberal side is connected to some, somehow to, to, to other uh, mystery people who are trying to stop the, uh, the good change reforms. Well, a uh, few words about institutional resistance and civil society engagement in the defense of democracy. So from the beginning of 2016, they were like, we are witnessing huge uh, protests uh, right after the first attempts of dismantling of the constitutional system. I mean, I'm 39 and I, in all my life, I never seen so many people taking to streets, going to demonstrations, shouting their, their needs against the, the government. Well, we are quite young democracy, so we do, still do not have this habit of, you know, demonstra demonstrations of uh, civil disobedience, uh, and we just, you know, go very quickly uh, from the uh, lesson on uh, democracy. Right after the new government was established, the, uh, there was a need for setting up, a, well, let's say, a, a, an organization that would stimulate the uh, streets demonstrations and the Committee of Defense of Democracy was set up, a huge organization, now they're uh, going through some internal problems, but still it's a, uh, it's a great organization that uh, stimulates uh, all protests uh, against the uh, reforms. Well, as lawyers we call this, this situation legal harassment since uh, since today, I mean, as of, as of 2015, we have like now around 1,000 court proceedings against protesting uh, persons. Well, uh, the new government is clever enough not to, you know, charge people for demonstrations. So they are just, you know, inventing very, uh, uh, very, I would say, wisely, um, you know, the types of charges that you might be uh, uh, might be put to the, let's say, court at least uh, for. So, you know, the people who are demonstrating, de demonstrating are accused of like littering the environment by using megaphones or candles. They are, uh, you know, being charged for assault on the police officers or blocking the uh, traffic, interference with the lawful assemblies, or even they are accused of insulting the monuments because of putting the uh, t-shirts with the slogan constitution uh, on them. So there is a very old fashioned provision in Polish law that you, know, you should not insult the monument. So they think, I mean, they you know, use this provision to um, uh, just to harass you, just to make your life harder uh, as a reaction to this uh, uh, court proceedings or uh, charges uh, the mass action with t-shirts just you know blossomed in Poland and like all monuments in Poland now are wearing uh, t-shirts with the name with the slogan constitution uh, okay so in terms of institutional resistance so to my mind the constitutional court the constitutional tribunal just you know lost its its battle after using all possible uh, legal ways to defend itself well the supreme court is still dramatically uh, fighting with the usage of European um, law instruments. But the train of illiberal changes runs extremely fast and the civilized pirates are always uh, faster. Well, so the, uh, there is a need for uh, inventing, the, uh, new, uh, inventing new strategies of, um, of mobilization. We see that the older generation protesting against uh, the, the reforms is, I mean, the older generations that are using like older methods that they learned during the communist time. But the younger generation, the, the youths, um, are quite creative 
and, uh, uh, and quite smart to mobilize, mobilize those who are actually not interested in politics at all. Well, so there were only two events that uh, were able to stop the government. First of them uh, was so-called black protest. Uh, so that was, that was a huge, extremely and tremendous uh, movement of women uh, that reacted towards the attempt to restrict the abortion law. So in 2016-17, uh, the far right group reached uh, out the, 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 the government and convinced the government and the parliament to, to work on the restrictions on uh, uh, anti-abortion law. I mean, anti-abortion law in Poland is extremely restrict restrictive, uh, but you know, there are some uh, um, situations that uh, women uh, have cho some choice. They just want to abolish all the, uh, all the possibilities to terminate the pregnancy. So black protests was the, one of the most beautiful and magnificent uh, event that uh, took place in, in Poland in the last three years. Hundreds of hundreds of thousands of women took to the streets, they all were black, wore black uh, as a sign of protest, and actually they convinced, I mean, they succeeded to, to convince the government to stop the works on the anti-abortion law. And the second, I would say, suc success, successful to, to a certain extent, uh, demonstration that was a demonstration called Chains of Lights. Uh, so last year, uh, hundreds of thousands of young people uh, got mobilized by uh, the social media, by you know, newly established organizations, and they took to the streets and they demonstrated so, I mean, uh, very long uh, until the, the President of the Republic vetoed two laws. Actually, next year, this year, uh, the laws were passed, but at least we got some success last year. Well, and uh, just to, you know, to, to, to answer a very, uh, I would say, important question. I mean, Poland is a member of the European Union since 2004. And the question is whether the e European Union, the EU, is ready to defend fundamental rights violated by one of its member states. Well, I'm not so, uh, I would say, optimistic. And I would say, not really. Well, uh, what we are witnessing now in the European Union countries is the, I would say, general crisis of the European Union values. Last weekend, we had elections in Sweden. The uh, far-right uh, party got almost 20%. We have a uh, uh, rise of far-right groups and, and parties in Germany, Austria, Italy, uh, Czech Republic, Slovakia. Um, there are some in Romania as well. So I wouldn't say that European Union is ready to effectively defend uh, the values uh, uh, of this organization. Well, European Union, Union was actually designed as a peaceful voluntary association of members interested in a, a common economy. It was a response to the you know, horrible events that happened during the uh, World War uh, Second. So the European countries decided to work together. So the European Union was actually not created uh, as a restrictive union. It was created as a space for talks, for debates, for, you know, the, the states should convince each other in order to uh, get a consensus. However, uh, the European Union probably never thought that when expanding its territory toward, you know, towards east, will be at some point forced to, um, well, to think how to kick out some of the countries because of the violations of its, uh, of its values. Well, but thanks to what is happening in Poland, EU is forced to creatively use its powers, mainly the Luxembourg Court mandate. Luxembourg Court is a court, uh, the highest court of the European uh, Union. Well, the question is also uh, whether our EU member states are ready to 
uh, whether they are ready to defend EU values in Poland. And there is, the, uh, there is a very interesting Irish example. The Irish court, the Irish judge, that was asked by, by Poland to uh, hand over a Polish citizen to Poland because of the, of the crime committed in Ireland, the Irish judge started to have a, you know, some second thoughts uh, and you know, started to have, to, 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 to have some doubts whether handing over, hand, handing over the, uh, the, the, the Polish citizen to Poland uh, will be safe for the accused person since Polish courts are not independent uh, any, anymore. Well, the answer of the Luxembourg court, court was not very, I would say, um, uh, well, it, was, it didn't give a right answer to the, to the Irish uh, judge. So at, at, the, uh, at, the, at the end of this, of, of this September of this month, the Irish judge uh, will decide finally whether the Polish citizens should be transferred to Poland or should be kept uh, in, Ireland, in Ireland in order to, to secure all the uh, the deferred tri uh, trial. Uh, also, some uh, few infrig infringements uh, procedure have been launched against Poland by the European uh, uh, Commission, but it takes ages. It takes like two, sometimes three years for the Luxembourg court to decide whether the European Union law was violated or not. And just like I said before, the civilized pirates are always faster. I may just skip the uh, nuclear option. It's maybe too legal, but um, maybe we should just, you know, I, I would like to also pose a question whether uh, whether Poles are ready to defend, defend democracy. Well, what we are witnessing in the last three years is, uh, is our strong and unprecedented divisions in the society. I mean, you can barely talk to, to you know, to someone uh, who's got different political opinion. There's so much aggression, there's so much hatred in the public sphere. Maybe you're, you're you know, witnessing the same situation here in, uh, in the US, but uh, at least in Poland, it's, kind, it's just unbearable. Well, what uh, we also see, it's all also some gender divisions. So what we see in the society that women, mostly young women, are more like, you know, ready to, to fight for the values, are more open, that they just, you know, more ready to uh, get involved in the defense of the democratic values. Where, where at the same time, young men especially are turning into radical uh, and neo-fascist uh, movements. Well, uh, the defense of uh, democratic values is not as strong as it should be since the government introduced unprecedented in the newest, newest, newest Polish history a governmental welfare payments to the families. And that really generates huge support to the current, uh, to the current uh, government. Well, the state of the political opposition, this is a huge, uh, a huge topic. Uh, for the last three years, they were not able to gener generate more than 25, 30% of support. At the same time, the government, the ruling party has more than 42, 43. So new strategies of, mobilizations, of, of mobilization are still to be invent, invented. Well, so it's 2018, almost 40 years after 1980. And I would say that the history has come almost full circle. We have like one party controlling almost all spheres of life. Democratic institutions become empty. They are just, you know, buildings filled with people, no values, no um, independent thoughts uh, inside the buildings. The mass protests uh, don't bring about actually any changes in most cases, at least for now. Conformism, it's a kind of, you know, like a common feeling that, you know, you have so many uh, spectacular con con uh, conversions. People who supported a few years ago liberal, liberal, liberal uh, values now that are you know, in the first line of, of uh, those who support the government. It's just a simple way to make career, just to, to, su to support the government. We do f uh, witness limitations on fundamental freedoms. 
And you feel that after this, those three years, a sense of resignation, and as we call in Poland, internal mental emigration. So uh, this is me once again. This is a picture uh, which was apparently shown uh, at the first page of Washington Post two, uh, two years ago. So this is me after almost 40 years pr protesting on the streets and still believing that uh, those democratic values are still to be um, to be defended. Yeah, thank you for your attention. Thank you so much for thank you. this depressing. Well, let's stay optimistic. Talk. Yes, <laughs> uh, we have plenty of time for uh, discussion. So we have two people with microphones. I propose that you guys be in the front, oh. otherwise you won't see. Yeah, thank um, you. And then you call mm -hmm. on people, yep. and then they okay. will provide microphones. Yeah, thank you. And if That's you wouldn't mind me. also, stay, uh, for our guest, saying your name and keeping your question to a question and not <laughs> a long comment. Stay. OK, there's a gentleman over there. Hi, I'm Shai. I'm, I'm also a, a, doctor, a doctor at law student. Um, I think that, thank you for your presentation. I think it's, uh, it was very interesting. Um, my question is, in a kind of way, your presentation lacks the history connotation of why, why does it happen. And also, I think, like, uh, in a way, same kind of, um, kind of you know, like uh, political uh, environments are going on in Hungary and also in Slovakia and maybe Romania and so on. Why do you think it happens in those kind of you know, like uh, nations? And also, in a way, how do you explain it? At least for me, it's, uh, it's kind of like maybe hard per to perceive. I can understand a bit, but how, how do you? explain racism in, in Poland, uh, which is a country that suffered heavily in the World War II under the occupation of the Nazi regime, which uh, considers Slavic people as uh, inferior and so on. Uh, mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. So maybe I'll just answer very quickly the, uh, the first question. So I, th I think that your two questions are somehow connected. Maybe just one thing that is missing in the presentation, but it's a kind of huge, huge topic, well, the two, two, 2015 was a um, time, was a year of a refugee crisis in Europe. So the racist rhetorics against refugees was also employed by the law and justice opposition party. So they were just, you know, they were just using the argument of defending the borders of Poland uh, against all those, you know, uh, uh, refugees coming to, to, to Europe. Actually, you know, they played this card very, uh, in a very smart way. I mean, I'm pretty sure that none of, you know, this people coming from, uh, the refugees coming from, 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 from South was thinking of, you know, settling in, in Poland. The, the, the final destination was Germany or France or the UK. But, you know, to, I mean, they were very smart in using this argument, saying that, you see, the current government agreed to accept 7,000 refugees. Uh, under the agreement uh, um, that was um, that was made uh, in the European Union, seven thousand is actually nothing. You know, Poland is like forty million people living uh, living in this country, and seven thousand is actually nothing. But seven thousand sounds like a huge number for those people, for most people in Poland, who actually never saw uh, you know person of color, person of different uh, religion. So seven thousand, it's a you know like a mystery huge number which really speaks to your mind. So they were actually using this, I would say a fascist rhetoric, saying that, you know, refugees are carrying their own bacterias, which uh, we Poles are not used to, it, to them. So, you know, we are trying to defend our country uh, against all those stuff. So, uh, so I think that you are, I mean, your two questions are really connected because the racism also, was a big argument, I mean big, I would say not an argument, by ret I mean that was a rhetoric that really spoke to the mind of, uh, of people. And he also asked like why it happened. I mean racism is one thing, but also the grant was actually already prepared to my mind for those populists. Because um, 
the previous government, which was in power for, the la for, for, for eight years, the center-right government, was extremely pro-European, -Euro pro-West. They were actually concentrated on things like, you know, infrastructure, highways, bridges, you know, buildings, all those stuff that people need. But actually they forget, they forgot to, you know, to speak about like values with, with its own uh, nation. Like, you know, patriotism, well, uh, and values like this were just, you know, left to the populists who very wisely used them to, you know, to launch this, uh, well, this horrible and uh, debate full, uh, filled with hatred. So patriotism was given to, the, to those who were actually, you know, waiting for them, for, for their momentum. And they were very successful in employing the patriotism into the uh, election, uh, election campaign. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm Brian Porter Sud from the history department here. Um, I, uh, I share your pessimism. I don't see an easy way out of this situation, but it will end someday, right? Uh, you know, PRL lasts for 40 <laughs> years. You know, we only yeah. have you know, 37 to go, so it yeah. will eventually end, right? As, and I wanted to ask you a question then, as someone engaged in the legal struggle right now, how what how do you return uh, out of this current situation. Uh, following legal precedents, the legal precedents that everyone is now fighting to defend will mean preserving everything peace has done mm. unless extra legal measures are adopted to do what they did and purge the people that they mm. put in power. And that threatens a cycle of just going back and forth and back and forth. It seems mm. very very frightening. So, uh, you know, what, what, what's the exit from, from this, whenever <laughs> it does a, eventually you know, happen? That's a million dollar question. Um, you know, honestly saying, you know, I'm not a big fan of, uh, you know, simple, simple answers. Like, you know, there's a leader of the opposition party and he says, when we get the power back, we just adopt one piece of law, you know, uh, which turn, you know, all the democratic, I mean, which, you know, which take all the democratic values back, which is not possible at all. I mean, for the last three years, you have, you know, so many new laws that started to operate, to be implemented. There were so, there are so many, like, court decision, decisions of the, you know, administrative bodies. So, and many of them, from the legal point of view, are not binding because the law is not in line with the constitution because some of the judges are not judges so you know you cannot as not as not, not a judge issue a, a, a verdict but the verdicts you know uh, who are in this um, actually who, we, we, which are uh, you know given which are issued so what to do with so many decisions in individual cases uh, already, uh, already ruled, already issued. This is a huge question for, you know, I don't know, maybe philosophers, maybe for, definitely not, not for, the, for the lawyers. I mean, the lawyers are, you know, helpful in designing the laws, but you need to have a support from, I don't know, from, probably for, uh, from, from philosophers, I think, like what to do with, with this chaos, you know, uh, with this swamp, actually, legal, with what do we have in, in Poland now is a legal swamp. Uh, so, um, well, maybe some standards that were worked out in South Africa, you know, after apartheid, or maybe some standards worked out in 1989 in Poland, you know, after the communism collapsed. Uh, it might be good to, to get back to them and you see, like, and to see, like, whether does still to be used once again in order to re-establish the democratic, uh, democratic uh, standards. I don't know, actually. <laughs> and that's really, uh, that's really pessimistic. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. The gentleman behind. Hi, I'm Benji. Um, I'd like to ask you about uh, elections in 2019, what the polls are saying. Is there, well, do you, do you have a fear of maybe uh, electoral fraud? Are they going to try to to mingle there, or is it mm -hmm. not possible? Um, is there any chance that they get, uh, they don't get a uh, parliamentary majority? 
And also you touched a bit about the issue of anti-Semitism, um, about um, the Soros conspiracy theories and all this, but there was also the Holocaust law of, uh, that it became, I don't know exactly, but it became illegal to link the Polish government or Poland with the Holocaust. How do you, do you see anti is there a rise in anti-Semitism in Poland and could that be considered as a litmus test for kind of in, in the history of Poland mm -hmm. for, for worse things to come? Um, and yeah, okay, those two are good, yep. thanks. Okay, thank you so much for this very important questions. Well, in terms of, uh, in, in terms of uh, anti-Semitism, so you just need to be aware that anti-Semitism is not, uh, I would say, official ideology of the new government. I mean, to my mind, some of the members of the, of the ruling party are, you know, anti-Semites. Anti but, um, yeah, anti-Semites, that's the right word. Anti Antisemites, yeah, sorry, antisemites. But um, this is not the ideology that works so effectively now. It's rather, you know, this, it's rather anti, anti, uh, mm, uh, um, I mean, it's, uh, yeah, it's rather racism in pure uh, form. Uh, it's this, you know, figure that was of, of a Jew that was replaced by the figure of, uh, of a refugee, mysterious refugee. Uh, who will come here and you know will rape our Polish women? This is the official rhetoric that you know is functioning um, uh, in Poland now, and that you know stimulates also the debates. Uh, in terms of election, nobody knows. Actually, in, uh, there's one year to go. Uh, we'll see. I mean, there, are, there is this kind of like ref, ref, uh, shuffling uh, on the opposition side now. Uh, the new parties emerging, the old parties are, you know, thinking about their strategies. But the mo mo uh, more important question is whether they are going to put their hands on, on the electoral system. So just to let you know that the Supreme Court uh, has a mandate to finally approve uh, the fairness of the, uh, of the final results of, of the elections. So. I can easily imagine that having your own judges in the Supreme Court will, I mean, that, that will assure that you will not, you're not going to lose your elections. So, you know, I mean, this is kind of, you know, huge threat that opposition parties are raising, that, you know, judges who are serving to the government will be very flexible in terms of whether the elections results are okay or not. So yes, I mean, I am uh, afraid of the, of the elections and I am afraid of, you know, um, maybe not frauds, as you said, but I am afraid of the, the, final, uh, the final decision whether the elections are fair, were fair or not. Hmm? Okay, so maybe the gentleman here. So thank you for this. Um a uh, very uh, thorough discussion, which does leave you a little bit aghast looking at it from the outside. I'm curious uh, if you could just say a few words about how this movement in Poland compares to the movements that you see in other places that have gotten so much support. You mentioned the sort of cut and paste uh, copying mm -hmm. of, of, of Hungarian politicians and policies. Um, what's curious to me about all these is that there are so many similarities, but eventually they're going to collide with one another. You know, we, we, the, you see them, uh, I mean, a, 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 an aggressive nationalism in this part of the world doesn't, you know, there's some mm. pretty awful precedents. Um, and we know that, for example, Putin supported um, Marine Le Pen um, with loans um, at certain points, and there's a lot of uh, thought about ways in which Russia has in actively encouraged these mm -hmm. kinds of mm -hmm. um, populist movements. Um, Poland is clearly a very different situation as far as Russia goes, but I'm just curious as to your sense of how they relate to one another, mm -hmm. aside from the surface similarities. Mm -hmm. Well, in terms of, uh, thank you for these questions. Uh, well, in terms of you know, Putin's role and Russia's Russian role uh, in Polish politics, well, until August this year, we were pretty convinced that Russia did not interfere in the, uh, uh, in the elections in 2015. However, 
there were uh, some media uh, articles, and there, there were some, there were some articles uh, that you know discovered some interference or indirect interference into um, not maybe in the, electro in the election process, but uh, in the events that uh, were just before the elections. Like you know, there were some situation with the gov government that members of the government that were taped secretly by a waiter in one of the in one of the restaurants and then apparently the tapes were you know uh, transferred to the to the media so you know the nasty the nasty things that ministers were saying you know were published so people just you know lost uh, well, many people lost the uh, the trust uh, uh, um, in this, in, in the previous government, so well, we do. I mean, I'm, I'm pretty sure that some of the very far right groups are somehow sponsored or, or at least stimulated by uh, Russians' money, and that's quite, uh, quite obvious. However, it is not still as, uh, still as I would say, visible. And uh, you know, like almost official, like in France or like in Hungary, for example. I mean, Poland and Russia, we have our tensions, you know, because of the uh, uh, plane, the plane crash uh, in 2000, 2010. So we are still like you know, a bit refraining from from you know uh, uh, from Russia. And in terms of like what what's common for all those you know nationalist movements. Well, this is a great question. I don't know because they're all like nationalists, so they should, you know, fight against each other. But apparently, they are like, you know, getting along quite well. I mean, you know, last year you could have seen uh, like members of the fascist party from Italy, uh, Hungary, or some other states, like you know, at the conference in the Polish Parliament. So, well, I was really like shocked by, you know neo-fascists sitting next to each other from Italy, from Germany, you know, Poles and Germans. That really, you know, makes no sense, actually. Uh, however, it somehow works. And uh, my theory is that the only, the only thing that, you know, keep them to, keeps them uh, together is the, uh, is, is the hate against the European Union. They just want to destroy European Union, and they they will take all you know their own ways. So uh, so the enemy uh, so the enemy enemy number one is the European Union. That keeps them together. Hmm? Okay, that will be you know the um, uh, gentleman behind and. Hey. Richard Wagnanik, what is the extent of uh, corruption in your opinion, measuring the difference perhaps between? government of the United States mm -hmm. or the higher echelon of the government of the United States and the pre-Ukrainian Orange Revolution. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, corruption is a huge topic for uh, Polish, uh, Polish government. However, contrary to, the, uh, to what is happening in Hungary now, so the government and you know, the, uh, the, the, the parties, uh, the ruling party in, in Hungary, it is all about money, you know? It is all about like how to squeeze, you know, European Union out to get as much money as as possible, uh, and you know, put uh, the money into the private pockets of the politicians. At least for now, uh, the, the the Polish government or the pol uh, ruling politicians, you know, they are not so much known for you know corruption, for uh, you know. For, Actually, this is not a huge topic for in Poland now. Well, the, corrupt, the corruption uh, level was reduced heavily over the last uh, 30 years. So, uh, so I wouldn't say that the corruption topic would work uh, for the uh, opposition. However, I mean, we have like more and more examples of political nominees, especially in uh, state-owned companies that are earning like, you know, huge money, you know, even for, you know, American standards are like huge. Uh, and we see that uh, the state-owned company are used to, you know, to be squeezed and to transfer at least some of this money to the, for the political, uh, political uh, um, actions. However, it's, it is 
still not a leading theme, I would say, uh, in Poland. Hmm? Can we take a couple more questions? Maybe you can take two. Okay, I'll take two questions. Okay, the, okay, one, two, three. <laughs> yeah, the gentleman. If you can be brief, that would Yeah. One of the institutions that, uh, that predates the present regime and will su presumably survive after it is the Catholic Church. And uh, the Catholic Church has served different kinds of political purposes in other parts of the world. And I wonder, um, you, you just mentioned it uh, briefly, saying that the dominance of the church has been featured by this regime. But um, I wonder whether um, there is any representation in the protest movements of uh, people who are of the Catholic faith. And whether, well, what do you think the role is? The Catholic Church is also an authoritarian institution in some mm -hmm. respects. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. You want to ask? Okay. <laughs> I am Christopher Sojanowski. I'm in a PhD in public health, but I work in the Balkans. Um, and I'm curious about kind of what is the end game of this current government? I do a lot of work. The end, like what is the final ah, okay. goal of this current government? Um, and I'm making comparisons to places like Serbia and Macedonia, which recently went through a government change. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Hi, my name is Roman Hutter. I'm a visiting grad student at the German department. And um, I would be curious about the um, political situation at the universities, because I just know um, from a colleague of mine, she's in China studies in, in, in Poland, and I know from her that she had to change the name of the field of her studies from gender studies to man studies. This was okay. <laughs> yeah, okay. it's very interesting. And, um, but how long, uh, the question is how long can she is she able to cheat, teach there? So my question is just if you know uh, a little bit about this and if you could tell us a little bit more mm -hmm. about the okay. uh, legal state mm -hmm. there. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so thank you very much. So answering uh, first questions of, uh, of the gentleman in terms of uh, Catholic Church. Okay, so, uh, so Catholic Church in Poland enjoys a special status, I would say, since, uh, I mean, during the communist time, the church was the I would say a safe space for you know preservation of democratic values and a safe space for democratic uh, I mean I mean opposition people. So it still enjoys a huge respect uh, in the uh, in the Polish uh, society. And uh, but what we see in the last thirty years after you know regaining the independence is the Catholic Church lost its I would say lost uh, its um, character, lost its, uh, well, became, um, went to the, I mean, went to the direction of uh, extreme conservatism. Uh, now it's uh, like an institution that is really like politicized uh, and is actually openly supporting, uh, supporting the, uh, the government. So it's not, this is not a, you know, the, 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 the space uh, for debates, for, for discussion. Most of the bishops are extremely conservative and those few of them which are perceived as liberal, uh, they are just silenced. So uh, and some priests who are, you know, very pro-liberal uh, values are just silenced. So I don't see uh, any role at least for now, for the Catholic Church to get engaged into democratic uh, discussion, since Catholic Church is very much benefiting from this uh, from this government. You know, all the restrictive abortion you know laws, an uh, uh, ocean of money that goes to uh, to the church organizations that keeps the church you know uh, quiet. There is a small group of. Uh, well-educated Catholics who are trying to maintain or at least stimulate democratic discussion, but it's kind of margin, I would say. Answering the question uh, of, of your question, what's the final goal of the government? Well, 
Well, I don't know. Actually, <laughs> the final goal is just to keep the power as long as it's possible. You know, they have, this, they have their own vision of the, of the Polish society. Conservative, patriotic, uh, rich as well in terms of economic, uh, economic issues. So, um, so the thing is that they just want to keep the power. Uh, they have this vision of 19th century Poland that was, you know, great, romantic, and, you know, always oppressed by, by the West and so on and so forth, or Russia. But, you know, the, uh, all these romantic, you know, things are, or thoughts are employed also in, uh, uh, in the rhetorics of the current government. So, yeah, just, just the power, pure power and, you know, long-lasting long -last, long -lasting power. And the political situation at the universities, well, so I was also a teacher at the Gender Studies at the Warsaw University, but, uh, and I closely follow what's going on. Well, there is, mm, well, may, there are not, I would say, direct attacks yet on those kind, kind of issues, but what we see is that there are plenty of NGOs, conservative NGOs, who are supported financially by the government, who are, you know, like harassing, harassing the uh, uh, lecturers, who are harassing the uh, um, administration uh, of the, like, you know, gender studies faculties. You know, they're just, you know, making their uh, they, they, they lives uh, harder. So we see that, you know, indirectly, uh, subjects like gender studies are, uh, yes, they, they are under threat. And I think this is not the end of the, uh, of the story. Thank you so Thank much. You so much. <laughs>